the children are not reading so many books anymore. They are reading short articles in Instagram or in TikTok. And actually, one year later, they got betrayed by other partners. And how many of us, our adults, get betrayed at the age of 14 and start your business all over again? So for our kids in our school, we are very confident. We need different kind of literacy skills in the future. Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Divya Gopalan. So, do you know the capital of Madagascar or the value of sign for 30 degrees? And why does ethanol dissolve in water? Well, if you can't answer those questions, then maybe your schooling has failed you. Or has it? To mark both Taiwan's and the World Teachers' Day, we'll be looking at what kind of education best prepares children for their future and what schools and teachers from countries across the globe can learn from each other. To give us a lesson on education, we welcome Vivi Stepanen, an educator from Finest Future, who's speaking to us from Yuvaskula in Finland. And here in Taipei, we have Professor Ben Sinier from National Taiwan University. Thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, I want to start this uh, episode today by asking you whether you think that those questions that we asked at the beginning of this show are a reflection on a child's education or how well prepared a child is for the future. Uh, Professor Benson? Well, uh, I think like uh, typically in uh, Asian countries, uh, uh, you know, memorizing and taking exams has been a big part of the education. And I think, however, this uh, a lot of skills needed for the future world is not really uh, developed in the school. So that's why I think this is uh, uh, in the past about 10 years uh, in Taiwan, there has been a big movement uh, of in, in, our, in Taiwan from bottom up. The teachers, because uh, within the past uh, uh, 20 years, many, many teachers are also thinking about our values should not just just uh, our value is not just to prepare the student for the exams. Uh, we, we, we can give students more. I think Taiwan right now, among the all the Eastern Asian countries, we have the most uh, loosened up uh, mm. uh, education among the country, especially in elementary school. Because in Asian countries, a lot of uh, countries that still have elementary school kids need to take an exam to decide where, uh, which middle school they can go to. However, in Taiwan, this kind of uh, mandatory exam is not necessary anymore for for the elementary school kids. And however, I think we still suffer from the uh, traditional Eastern Asian culture that uh, preparing for the exams during the middle school, uh, high school. And that's still something we are, we are working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk about it being loosened up somewhat in elementary level, but the question is, how much more further can can it go? And maybe perhaps if we use Finland as an example, Vivi, can you explain to us what the attitude towards education there is and classroom learning? Yes, uh, I can maybe comment about the exams first. So in the Finnish elementary school, the first uh, numbers are given in fourth grade. So before that, the kids don't get any numbers uh, any time. So the teacher will give you, of course, feedback. Maybe where, what you should study more and where are you good already? Like, hey, let's uh, focus on the positive side too, what you are really good already. So I think it's really important to um, build the self-esteem uh, for kids. Like, hey, I can do this and uh, I think in Finland, we try not to focus on exams. We are trying to really, really learn things and understand things. Why is this like this? And uh, we teach the kids to uh, the skills to learn. Like, how do you learn? How do you understand things? And the exams are just one part of the evaluation. Well, one thing that schools in Taiwan love to do is rank students according to performance. But who's ranking the schools? Well, it turns out the OECD does. And according to the latest edition of their program for international student assessment study, Asian countries seem to produce the best scholastic results. China's selected areas of Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu and Zhejiang topped the rankings in all three categories, followed by other Asian education systems, with European countries appearing in the bottom half of the top 10. 
So, Benson, what do you make of those rankings? Well, I think like a uh, Taiwan student did very, pretty well in math and science. And reading literacy is something that uh, Taiwanese students have been pretty weak in the past. I mean, in 2015, uh, we also did, didn't do very well in PISA 2015 on reading and also in 2018. And why is reading literacy so important? Because uh, all of the countries, like especially OECD countries, they, they regard that in the next 20 years, okay, uh, a lot of jobs will be, you know, two out of every two jobs, one job will disappear, okay? so. With the world changing so fast, how can we make sure our next generation to uh, survive in this kind of world? And so all of the countries, they, 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 they all think that, wow, our next generation have a very good skill in self-learning. Okay, that's what Vivi said. So and, and among the, all the skills you need for self-learning, reading literacy is the most important thing. So that's why you know PISA is putting a lot of effort in reading literacy. And also like Taiwan, or although we didn't do well in 2015 and 2018, but we are also following uh, other countries, especially other uh, like uh, Asian countries way, like we reform our entrance exam for college school and or our entrance exam for high school, which we reform this exam so that literacy uh, will play a uh, bigger role in the exam. Right, and and if uh, Vivi, in that sense, you know, Finland comes at 16th in mathematics according to those rankings, does that bother Finland that much? Does Finland really focus on those kinds of statistics and rankings? Or uh, what is the approach to education? Because Finland is known for its ed progressive education system. Um, yes, there has been uh, some talks about the weakening PISA results. But my personal opinion is that it doesn't matter so much. <laughs> like, what is your position? Like, is it important to uh, know mathematics or is it important to know where to use it, how to solve problems uh, in the real life? Um, but what I am worried about, not only in Finland, but uh, in, in the whole world, is the literacy skills weakening. I think the social media and the change of the literacy environment is, is a problem everywhere. Like, the children are not reading it so many books anymore. They are reading short articles, short stories in Instagram or in TikTok. And that really changes something like and, and I think we should also see that in school and in education. Uh, we need different kind of literacy skills in the future. Benson, is that an issue that's even being looked at or even considered right now in Taiwan's education system? Is that our educators even talking about that right now? Unfortunately, I think that in Taiwan, the society, especially the middle class family parents, they still give a lot of pressure to the school and to the teachers whether their, their kids can do well in the entrance exam for the next level of their education. So, uh, but I think one uh, one good thing is that in the past uh, 20 years, uh, there's another trend coming up. Oh, sorry, in the past 10 years, because in 2014, Taiwan uh, approved a new law on experimental education or, or what you may call it alternative education. So in Taiwan, if you have your own teaching philosophy uh, and, or if you have your own plan of teaching, you can come up with your teaching plan and apply to the government. So it is a mix of people of different expertise and they are reviewing your teaching plan. And if they feel that your plan makes sense, uh, they will allow you to uh, or to run your own institution and you can start to recruit students, teachers and you know. So for me, like uh, in 2014, uh, I after the law got approved, the next year I decided I want to do my own institution because I think uh, if we just give a lot of speeches, uh, it, that cannot convince the whole society. That cannot convince the middle class families. Okay, so you you have to come up with your own institution running uh, under using your teaching philosophy. And we want to prove to the society, say that hey, in Taiwan, kids doesn't need to practice exam in six years of middle school and high school, and then they can still do well in their future life. So that's why I started this school. Uh, the the name is the By the Student School. Then the, the the abbreviation is By BTS School. Okay. Must so, make that very uh, popular. 
<laughs> so, uh, so after nine years of running the school, and actually we have very uh, amazing results. For instance, like in Taiwan, many kids like to play Minecraft. And one of the largest Minecraft server in Taiwan was uh, run, was hosted by our student. They come up with this business, okay? They, they say, hey, many people is playing Minecraft and can we come up with our own server? So they decided to build their own server. So they get everything set up and then they also uh, contact some YouTuber to co-brand their service. And then they roll out the server, it became a big hit. And the server was one of the largest uh, server in Taiwan at the time, and they were at the age of 13, okay? And actually, one year later, they got betrayed <laughs> by other partner, and but they, they they overcome that, and they start a new server. So, and how many of us, uh, adults, get betrayed at the age of 14 and start your business all over again? So for our kids in our school, we are very confident that uh, with the skills that we help them to build like presentation, marketing, uh, and also self-learning and all kinds of skills, self problem solving skills, uh, they can do well. I, I, we believe they can survive and they can create something very big in the future in Taiwan. And I, we are not the only school, because in Taiwan there are more and more PBL-based alternative education uh, school like us are uh, 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 getting more and more in Taiwan. So this becomes a new trend. Yeah, it's great to see that uh, schools in Asia or societies in Asia are now thinking of different ways of trying to ed educate your, their children rather than the testing and memorization system that you know, I, I went through uh, growing, going to school in Asia. Vivi, and this is where I want to come to you. And, and it was a point that Benson made about trust the trust in teachers. Uh, one thing that sets Finland apart is that teachers can set up their own curriculum um, for their classes and for, for their students, which is very unusual in this part of the world. Can you tell us how that's working over there and, and the trust they have from the parents and the authorities? Okay, here in Finland, yes, we have the curriculum, but it's very, how could I say, abstract. It doesn't say like that a child must know this, 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 but more of like skills, like uh, uh, before sixth, sixth grade, the child must, uh, uh, for example, be able to do or be able to understand like a larger idea, more like that. And the teacher is the person who decides how do we achieve that goal? For example, I have been teaching through music, through drama, like the other education, through different kind of games in classroom. So uh, I would say that teachers in Finland are highly professionals. Uh, like we study at least five years in the university and we, uh, we really think, how do we teach this thing? Like what is our own teaching philosophy? How and, and it's okay to show your individual skills and uh, personality in teaching. For example, I am very creative uh, type of person. So I really uh, want to uh, create something new all the time with my students. Well, it seems there are still some very strong ideas about what a teacher should look and be like in Taiwan. Our connected team investigated the story of one educator from the city of Taoyuan who didn't fit the traditional mold. Here's her story. Sitting 他不收我费我也不收他钱 
去年开始是公开，到今年第第二年又发生事情了。对，那就是四月的时候有接到一个不具名的投诉，那是。他是寄信到桃园市教育局，跟我以前的学校，那就是说啊，我身上有刺青，那我我的 IG 上面的图片，呃，很煽情，觉得说我这个老师到底是要教学生音乐，还是要教学生当 AV 女优，这样子，他觉得我不适合当老师，那我就自己写了一些澄清。对，第一个就是我刚刚讲的，因为是互惠，所以我,我必须将这些作品公开，而且这些是艺术照片，对，已经不没不是色情照片，而是艺术品。然后再来就是有强调我在教学的课堂中，从来没有去跟学生讲我的账号是什么。对他们有人可能，当然学生很厉害，很会搜别人的账号，很会肉搜。我即便我的我的账号的内文根本没有写说我是老师，也没有写我是哪我在哪里教学，对他们还还是找得到。那学校的做法就是说，嗯、呃，你先不要来上班，我、哦、先请假，对，然后避风头。下一说为什么要避风头？又不是说很多很多人在在抗议我这个人教的不好，或者我只是因为我自己的是那个 social media， 我的我的作品，我的艺术照，他们把它看成是色情照，那我就必须要自己请假，而且我还要自己付代课费这样子。那我那一天代课费超过我一天的薪水，所以。其实我很明显的知道学校暗示我就是怎么走对学生比较好，因为其实我当时最 care 的就是学生要怎么办，我不希望因为我这件我觉得很荒谬的事情，那影响到学生，影响到学生嗯的受教权，所以后来就想说啊，既然都讲得这么明白了，那我就辞职吧。Well, you can watch the full version of this video on our website and the Taiwan Plus News YouTube channel. Right, let me go to you, Benson. I know you're familiar with this story in this case. I just want to get your thoughts on this and, and perhaps uh, kind of spin it in a way. Do you think someone like Vivi, given her purple hair, would be accepted as a teacher in a, in, in a state school here, public school? I think that there shouldn't be any problem. Actually, I think for the news you just mentioned, I think you will lack the uh, the following part of the news. Actually, uh, uh, I think the, about in June, okay, they they would they would they have a investigation committee in their school to invest uh, this case, and in June they make the conclusion that the teacher is not guilty. The teacher has didn't do anything wrong. So I think I, I don't want there to have a misunderstanding as if like in Taiwan, the rural or the government are against this kind of thing. No, okay, if the teacher didn't do anything wrong, she doesn't have to resign. So it's just that uh, during the investigation, the teacher uh, suffered, uh, it was suffering during the time. I think one problem in Taiwan is that uh, the principals of the schools or oh, they are under very heavy, big pressure from the uh, parents. Uh, that in Taiwan, parents have a lot of power to influence school. And, and you know, because if the parents is not happy about the school, they can go find uh, like, a, a, you know, uh, they can go to a mayor, they can go to, to find uh, uh, like, like uh, Congress people, congressmen or whoever to, to give, to has, give hassle to the schools. I think the issue you bring up here is schools in Taiwan, especially public schools in Taiwan, they worry too much about pissing off the parents. In this case, if the, te the school doesn't have to worry about it, because according to the rule, this teacher didn't do anything wrong, okay? Just protect the teacher, give the teacher support. Even if the, the parents is giving uh, the school hassle, just be strong. Okay, so I think the issue now is that we have to give school uh, officials more confidence 
when they receive this kind of uh, injustice uh, request from from the parents, they can they have the guts to say no. My teacher's doing the right thing. Our teacher didn't do anything wrong. You shouldn't uh, give pressure to our teacher like that. I I I, I really hope our school in the future can can say that to. To those right. Parents. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me flip this around for Vivi here and talk about, you know, there should be at the same time a way for parents or authorities or uh, like the, a bigger body to express concerns about how a teacher is teaching, um, given especially in Finland where you can have your own curriculum. Is there, is there such an avenue and how, how often is that taken up? I think... Yes, of course, in Finland too, the, the, uh, the parents are sometimes complaining or saying that, hey, you should do more of this and please change things. But I think the schools are quite strong and the principals are the ones who are saying to the parents that I trust my teachers and we are doing everything according to the national curriculum. So when you do, uh, when you do, um, accomplish the curriculum uh, goals, everything is fine. You can teach however you see as a pedagogist that this is suitable for my class, this is good for my students and they are learning. Uh, you can, you are just fine. I think the parents cannot complain about it and you don't need to change anything uh, if you are, uh, if you are achieving the goals. I, I can follow up. I think one. I think I. I do think there's a problem in Taiwan. I think due to the immature, uh, political culture, because the reason why public schools worry so much about pissing off the parents is that, as I mentioned, that usually parents will go to the city councilor, and because city councilor need the vote from those uh, their local voters. So once the parent goes to the city councilor, the city councilor will oh no no problem. I'll I'll take care of that. So they'll give a lot of pressure to the school. Uh, I think that is something definitely we should uh, work on uh, in the future to let the city councillors, to let the legislate legislatures, to respect the expertise of the education of the schools, uh, not just you know, you know, following the voters' complaint and giving hassles to the school. Mm -hmm. Trust, trust. Um, uh, you bring up another point about future of education, and I want to move this along very quickly as we're running out of time. Benson, is there much talk right now or consideration in education, in, in the more public school system, about ChatGPT and other AI tools that will probably be part of many of these children's future? Well, actually, yes, because in Taiwan right now, in order to get into the college, you have to prepare your learning portfolio, okay? Uh, in the past, uh, portfolio you usually you are done by yourself doing hand, uh, by handwriting, uh, in the past. But uh, but later, uh, recently, because of the ChatGPT, there has been teachers uh, teaching the student how to use ChatGPT to help you prepare your learning portfolio. But not just uh, ask the ChatGPT to write everything for you. No, you have to have come up with your own, your own input to ChatGPT. I have to say that the use of ChatGPT uh, create another kind of unfairness because uh, in the city schools, uh, teachers, they get to know this kind of uh, technology better. But however, in the rural areas, okay, the school there, uh, not that many teachers knows about this kind of thing. So we are kind of, we, I think we are worried about this might introduce another kind of unfairness due to the unfamiliar, the, the, fam the, the different area of the teachers, they, they don't have, they don't know the technology at the s same level. And Vivi, uh, very briefly, what kind of conversations are our educators having in Finland about the use of AI and chat GPT? Well, first, I think the conversation was like, oh, this is a huge problem, what should we do? But I think now uh, many teachers are trying to figure out how we can use it to help us as teachers, like how we can use chat GPT or other AI tools in our teaching and how we can teach the students to use it. The only problem is that um, some students are using it when they are not supposed to, for example, writing essays or such things. But fortunately, it's quite easy for the teacher to pick up if the student is using chat GPT in the classroom. Because in Finland, 
uh, we have like the teacher and the student should have kind of like a bond between them. So as a teacher, I know what is my student's level. So I can easily see if they use two fancy words or <laughs> they are uh, they are writing a super nice essay and just previous we week the essay was <laughs> very bad so of course then i can see that hmm, something has happened and i can talk to the student we can have a conversation about what is good thing in ai tools and why we are not using it every time why <laughs> why mm. we should learn to write by ourselves Right. I feel like there's still so much more to talk about and AI can be a whole other show in itself. Thank you both so much, Professor Ben Signe and Vivi Stefanen, who's speaking to us from Finland. Thank you both for your time and your insight. It has been great to have you both. Um, before you go, I want to just say a huge thank you to both of you and all the teachers out there that are doing so much for our children. I have a seven year old and all the future generations. Thank you. Well, if you made it to the end of this episode, you should probably know that the capital of Madagascar is Antananarivo. The sign of 30 degrees is 0.5 and ethanol dissolves in water because it has a polar oxygen hydrogen bond. But as we all know nowadays, you can just look that up and get with a click the answer right away. So again, the question is, what does that mean for the future of our education? Before we go, a huge thank you again to all the educators and teachers for their efforts and to our audience at home. It's been great to have your company. Goodbye and stay connected. Thanks.